what motivates me. So I'm going to tell you my, my personal story, which I don't often do. So we're friends, right? For when I was 14 years old, I was diagnosed with a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa is a deteriorating eye condition of the retina that leads to blindness. So from where I'm standing right now, I cannot see a single one of you. So if you want to flip me the bird, go ahead. No, <laughs> but I remember when I was 14, sitting in the eye doctor's chair with my young parents and have an eye doctor tell my parents that their son would be going blind by the age of 30. Um, they were freaked out over it. I didn't know what they were worried about. I said, 30, I'm 14 years old. 30 is light years ahead. Well, guess what? When you're 54, 30 is light years behind you. My parents, I learned years later, went into a, a meeting with the doctor without me after this, and, and they asked what's going to happen to our son. He said he's going to end up weaving baskets. Great bedside manner. In the years that followed that, my parents, like, Good parents didn't. They took me all around the country to every eye institute and clinic they could find, but there's no cure for this condition. And then I came home one day, I was 16 years old, and my dad died suddenly at work, unexpectedly. And uh, my mom had to give up her house, and we moved in with my grandparents. My grandparents were Italian immigrants who came right off the boat at Ellis Island at the age of 20 and 16, my grandmother. And in that household, I was blessed to grow up as a teenager under the guidance of that immigrant values of which all of us here share so much in different ways. In my house, my grandparents spoke Italian, fluent Italian, obviously that's where they came from. They never let me learn the language for two reasons. One, they wanted to talk about things in front of me. <laughs> and the other, my grandfather said, this is America, we speak English outside this household. There was no welfare, no unemployment, there was hard work. This was a great opportunity to escape Benito Mussolini and the fascists and come here for them and build a new world. And I had the fabulous blessing of living in that, that household and then going on to college. But by the time I got out of college, I had lost almost all my eyesight. I couldn't drive and I couldn't read. And I became a client of the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and a Social Security Disability recipient. So I became part of the entitlement state that's eating up our government budget, putting us into debt. But like any young man coming out of college, I wanted to go to work and build a career, so I listened to my counselor. The counselor said, well, go get a master's degree. And that's good advice, so go get a master's degree. And they wanted me to get a master's degree and be a social worker. And I said, no, I'll get a master's degree, but I want to get an MBA in business, and I want to go out and make money. They looked at me like, <gasps> make money. No, you, so sorry, they, they didn't understand that. They were confused, but I did it, and I got my MBA, and I was told once that I finished ahead of my class in record time, and I went out, and I wanted to go to work, I wanted to get married, I had a girlfriend, but I said, you know, unless you have a job, I don't think I should try to get married and have a family, not on Social Security. That's no way to live. So I went out into the job market, and that was 1980. There was this new stuff emerging, affirmative action was pretty strong. And I was told by my counsel, well, you'll get a job. And I, I went out to corporation after corporation after corporation. Top of my class, 4.0, the MBA in finance and marketing and undergraduate degree in business and economics. And, and I was qualified. AT&T, IBM, Xerox, Scalette, you name it, I went there. But see, under affirmative action, once a company fills its quota, that, that's it. They look over their shoulders at handling somebody with a disability. You know, you know what kind of lawsuit could follow that person? 200 interviews, I couldn't get a job. Two years. Two years with my friends and neighbors, my guys I grew up with were out and getting married and starting families, and I was sitting home on Social Security disability and trying to get work, and finally one day I had enough of this, and I called the counselor, and she came to my mom's house. I can remember clear as day her sitting in the living room and explaining this, and my girlfriend is there, and I... She said, Steve, don't worry about it. You can get your Social Security, you have rent subsidies, food stamps, and we can send you to vocational training. Vocational training is where they teach you to weave baskets and assemble pot holders. That was the worst day of my life. I could feel that I was being sucked forever into an entitlement state of reliance on others, that I had no future. But at the same time, I was reading a book. It was a book on tape. It was the biography of John Paul Getty. 
And in Mr. Getty's biography, he says, if you're ever, who had been found himself broke a number of times on his way to become a multi-billionaire wildcat oil driller, he said, if you find yourself out of work at the bottom of the barrel and you have to push a broom, be the best in the world at pushing that broom. Years later, I learned that that came out of a sermon of Martin Luther King in 1952. So taking that to heart, I lowered my sights from being an MBA, entry-level marketing or finance person, and I said, I'll take any job I can get. My girlfriend at the time, who would become my wife, found an ad in the paper, and it said, earn dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, sell kitchen cabinets. So I like the dollar signs. <laughs> no college degree, commission, I, I can do that. I went for a job interview to this rinky-dink, it was 1980, this rinky-dink little cabinet show up in um, Union, New Jersey. Little small business guy, grungy, and I walked in, I said, Mr. Randolph, you know, I can do this. You know, I can, I can, I can do this job. He was skeptical about it, and I said, sir, let me try this. Let me do this for you for free. Give me two weeks, I'll work for free and I'll show you what I can do. And he let me do that. I, I, I hope he did it out of his own self-interest, certainly not out of pity, that's what I want. So I, I, in the, if you ever bought a kitchen, you understand the kitchen business, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dishes, different cabinet styles and doors and colors, and I took the price list home over the weekend, and there were no enlarging copiers, and my, my mom and my girlfriend took that price list, and they enlarged it into big one-inch numbers, and I, end, I went into work on Monday morning, I had this price book about this thick, and they looked at me like I was nuts. And I went through my 45-minute professional training program, and I hit the showroom floor. Folks, I can tell you, if you entered that showroom in the next two weeks in Union, New Jersey, you were not leaving alive without buying a kitchen. From Steve I, I got the job. And I became the company's best, best salesman. A year later, I was the manager of a show up on Route 17 in Paramus, New Jersey. It was 1981. If you remember that year, interest rates were hitting 14, 15 percent. The economy was in its doldrums. Ronald Reagan had just come into office. The construction industry was collapsing. And I got married. And as happens with a lot of people who got married, my wife got pregnant. And I'm in my showroom. And in walks my boss in 1981, and he says, Steve, I have some bad news for you. He says, um, the economy's really bad. I'm going out of business. Um, and he said, but I have an idea. I owe you money, and there's this showroom, a little grungy place. He said, why don't you buy this place? You're really good at this. I had a choice. I could either go back to where I was or buy a business. I had no money, but you know, folks, there's a great book by the Asian emperor Sun Tzu called The Art of War. And he tells, good reading for the Tea Party group, and he tells, he tells us in his book, if you want your, your troops to fight their hardest, position them between their enemy and their backs to the edge of a cliff. Well, my feet were on the edge of that cliff, and I was not getting pushed over that edge back into that, into that abyss. So I needed to come up with $6,000 to buy the showroom. <laughs> and I had to go to the bank, the special bank, the bank of mom, <laughs> and I borrowed that money, and I bought that store, and I walked in one morning, now it was 1982, and I had my own business. I didn't know what, who I was going to, I had no working capital. I learned a lot of things, by the way. I learned how to get a kitchen cabinet delivery from a factory, and how to, you know, get those cabinets and be making deliveries at 10, 11 o'clock at night. People are like, what are you doing delivering so late? Little did they know if I didn't get the checks in the bank the next day before the truck got back, my check was going to bounce. Or how to give the, um, the phone company the public service check and public service the phone company check. They got over that. They learned that trick after a while. <laughs> that was called cash flow management. <laughs> they didn't teach me that in my MBA program. <laughs> but, you know, I couldn't drive. And I, I couldn't leave it. I, so I had this idea. I said to people, bring me in your measurements. This was unheard of in the industry. See, in the kitchen business, a salesman comes to your house, and they draw pretty pictures, and they sell you all this stuff. I said, I can't come into my showroom, and I will beat any price. Bring me your measurements. I'll beat any price. And if I can't beat your price, I'll give you a free dishwasher. I never gave away a free dishwasher. <laughs> but Ronald Reagan was president. He had cut taxes. He is building the economy. And slowly over time, we struggled for years. But all of a sudden, I woke up one day in 1988, and I was the largest kitchen cabinet dealer in the tri-state area.
with, with three showrooms. I had to build a factory in Patterson. I took one of the old silk mills in Patterson and made it into a cabinet plant because my suppliers couldn't keep up with my demand. By the time I sold my company, I had almost 100 employees. I went from being a Social Security disability recipient to a successful businessman, and then to becoming the mayor of the building. Not because of a government program, but because of the free market economy developed under Ronald Reagan, because of an opportunity given by business, not by government, and the ability to make money. That's what America is all about. And that's what I'm here to fight for. I'm here to fight hard because I know how destructive the entitlement state is. I felt those cold, cruel fingers of the entitlement program wrap around my own soul. I was fortunate enough to have a family and an opportunity and a break. A lot of people don't. A lot of good people are relegated to that life. And government likes it that way. They like it that way. They want the more clients, the better. And I'll fall face to face with any single solitary social worker who wants to tell me otherwise, because I have been there. And I'm not going to let anybody else go there. I'm going to save the future of this country and do whatever I can do. I owe it to my country. We owe it to our country, folks. I'm urging you to join in this effort, because what you saw in that video earlier tonight will crush the souls of American entrepreneurship and individual liberty. And that's what's at stake. That's why we're here. On April 6th, we're going to go to Washington, D.C to deliver that powerful message to John Boehner and Eric Cantor and others that we want real spending cuts now. I'm going to join Michelle Bachman and Rand Paul and others. And I hope you'll join us. I'm going to have buses from across New Jersey. I'm going to raise the money for those buses. I'd ask you all to be part of that if anybody here wants to join in the effort and bring their bus there. We're going to put more people in front of the United States Capitol calling for spending cuts than America has ever seen before on April 6th before that deadline. <laughs> Folks, I, um, again, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, we are the last great hope for America. It's not coming from the leadership. You are the leaders. Yes. We, this nation was born of the founders of this country. Well, we are the defenders of this country, and it's up to you and I to do that. So thank you for being here. We have a couple of words from some of our great Tea Party leaders who I'd like to invite up right now. Mark Falzone, I think. Mark. <laughs>